Happy Monday and welcome to week seven of remote learning. We hope you had a great weekend. We had some beautiful weather. We hope you were able to get outside and enjoy some fresh air and sunshine. Okay, today we're going to be talking about the Italian Renaissance. We're going to focus on four major artists of this period. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say this is not going to be an in-depth discussion. We just want to get a cursory look at these four artists, some of their major works and why they were important. I also want to say you're not going to see a camera view of me down in your right hand corner. And that's because I didn't want to obstruct your view of the artist's work. So let's take a look at our essential questions, which will guide our examination. Hopefully we can answer these three questions by the end of today's lecture. Number one, what styles and techniques made Renaissance artwork different than work produced during the Middle Ages? Number two, who are the most significant artists of the Italian Renaissance? And number three, how did the work of these artists demonstrate the emerging ideals of the Renaissance? So let's start with what we know already. We know Renaissance is translated to mean rebirth. And what that means is it's a revival of classical tradition. And when we say classical traditions, we're talking about the traditions of the Greek and Roman cultures, which we refer to as Greco-Roman tradition. We know that during the Middle Ages, Greco-Roman traditions were either lost or suppressed by the church. During the Renaissance period, people had a renewed interest in those traditions, and they wanted to go back and explore them. This is all born out of the humanism movement. We know that humanism was a movement that focused on the potential of the human being to reach a full potential through learning and education. There was also secularism. Secularism was a focus on worldly things, on the here and now. During the Middle Ages, people tended to focus on salvation and what was going to happen to them after they died. During the Renaissance era, people were more focused on the here and now and trying to make this world a better place, which is closely tied to humanism, education, and learning. You can make your life better through education. So when we think about the Renaissance, think about it as an examination of the past with a new perspective on human life. It's seen the world in a different way. And nowhere better was this exemplified than through the artwork of the major Renaissance artists. So let's take a look at two pieces of art. One of these pieces of art is from the Middle Ages, and one is from the Renaissance. Now, which one of these do you think is from the Renaissance? If you said piece number two, then you are absolutely correct. Now, in both pieces of art, you see the same theme. The same event is on display, and that is the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. However, this one on the right was created by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, although the theme is the same, it should be very obvious that the techniques are different. This one on the right, created by da Vinci, looks far more sophisticated than the one on the left. And why is that? Well, let's take a look at some thematic approaches and techniques that the Renaissance artists used. Renaissance artists tended to focus on individuals. This was born out of humanism. Renaissance art artists understood that humans were very complex. And so they tried to depict that complexity through human emotion. This lended to realism in Renaissance artwork. But not just because Renaissance artists were depicting human emotion, they were also trying to depict human anatomy in a realistic manner. So if we look at Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of the Last Summer, Supper, excuse me, not the Last Summer, Summer, the Last Supper, we can see 
that there is certainly emotion, but everybody seems to have their own individual emotion, which creates complexity. And also we can see that their anatomy seems to be realistic. Everybody seems to be in proportion to one another and very detailed. Now, there were other techniques that Renaissance artists used to give their art a more realistic quality. Perspective is the ability to show depth or distance on a flat surface. You may have learned about perspective in art already. It is a geometric or mathematical approach to creating that three-dimensional sense on a flat surface. It's using a foreground, a middle ground, and a background that has a horizon line and a vanishing point to give that illusion of depth. Not only does it make the portrait more real, but it's captivating and it brings the viewer into the portrait with them. There's also sfumato, which is the use of soft lines. Soft lines provide detail, often used in drawing out human figures. And there's another technique called chiaroscuro, which is the use of light and dark. This creates contrasts. And again, we have an illuminated foreground, a darkened midground, and then an illuminated background again. And this lends to that sense of depth in the painting and makes a much more realistic piece of art. All of this was an effort to emphasize balance, proportion, and harmony along with the human spirit. And all that is encapsulated here in Da Vinci's Last Supper. So let's take a look at one of our first major artists of the Renaissance period, and that is Donatello. He was born in Florence, Italy in 1386. He was a master of sculpture, and he worked in many mediums, namely marble and bronze. He's best known for a statue of David that he created in his later life. This is David here. David is a figure from the Bible. In the story of David in the Bible, he, as a young man, kills the giant Goliath in battle. What this piece of art illustrates is it's taking some of that classical tradition of creating a figure, a, a nude figure in the round as a statue. This was something that hadn't been done since the Roman Empire. So Donatello creates the first statue of this type during the Renaissance period. But it's not notable just for that. When we look at the quality of the statue, it's very realistic. It's demonstrating humanism by showing David with emotion and also making him realistic. Look at his anatomical structure. It's very detailed. Now, Donatello had a major patron, and that was the Medici family. You may remember the Medici family. They were a powerful banking family in Florence, and they were perhaps the most powerful family in Europe during the Renaissance period. They were patrons of the arts, meaning that they commissioned artists, they paid artists to create works of art for them. Donatello was uh, so closely tied to the Medici family that after his death, he was buried next to a member of the family. Our next Renaissance artist is Leonardo da Vinci. He was born in 1452 outside of Florence. He had no formal education, but he would enter in an apprenticeship as a boy. He too was commissioned by the Medici family to create works of art. Now he was a true Renaissance man, which means he became a master in many different, uh, di different skills. He was an artist. This is one of his most famous pieces of art, the Mona Lisa. But he was also an engineer. 
He drew many designs for inventions, and he was a scientist. He would do many anatomical studies of the human body in his lifetime. Now, da Vinci had a profound interest in the natural world. He filled journals with studies of dissections, architectural designs, and ideas for new inventions. So that interest in the natural world in the here and now is an example of secularism and some of the things he focused on, again, human anatomy by doing dissections of cadavers, dead bodies, architectural designs, and inventions. Now, this is interesting. I'm going to leave a link uh, on the uh, class page today to a Da Vinci invention quiz. Uh, it not does not count in the grade, but if you want to explore some of the designs that Da Vinci had left in his books, his books were basically lost after his death. They would not be found until centuries later and then published. And over here, you can see one of the designs from his books that a group had created into an actual mock-up here. So this would have been a design that Da Vinci created for underwater scuba gear. So he had some really brilliant ideas, which didn't come to fruition during his time, but really were visionary in their uh, concepts. So I would invite you, if you'd like to take that Da Vinci invention quiz, you'll find the link on our class page. And again, it's just for fun. It won't count as a grade, but you'll see some of the designs for the various uh, concepts Da Vinci had. Our next artist is Michelangelo. Michelangelo was born in 1475. At age five, his mother became ill and he was sent to live with a family of stone cutters. After that, he would become an apprentice to a master painter. So over here, we have on the right-hand side some of the sculptures that he made during his life. This is a sculpture of, again, the character David from the Bible. And down here, this sculpture is called La Pieta, which means the pity. This figure is the figure of Mary cradling the body of Jesus after he's come off the cross. Like Donatello, Michelangelo, Michelangelo was also commissioned by the Medici family in Florence, and he was also commissioned by the church. So in our last lecture series, we talked about the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo was commissioned in 1508 to repaint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And beginning in 1535, he would also paint the wall behind the altar here. Now, I'd invite you again, if you want to take a closer look at this, just go back to last week's lecture. And Mr. Jackson and I had posted, you can actually do a virtual tour of the Sistine Chapel. And our last artist that we're going to take a look at is Raphael. Raphael was born in 1483. He was a contemporary of Michelangelo, meaning they were working around the same time. Raphael was very popular and he's best known for his portrait work, which we can see here. This would have been a depiction of one of his friends. And like many of the other artists, he was commissioned by the Medici family as well as being commissioned by the church. Raphael had become the most important artist in Rome during his lifetime. He was actually appointed the commissioner of antiquities of Rome, which meant that he was in charge of all of the artistic projects in the city. This was something that the church appointed him to do. So anything involving architecture, painting, the decorating or preservation of antiquities, meaning uh, old relics from Greco-Roman tradition, that would have been something that Raphael would have been in charge of. So the church was a major patron of his. One of his most important works is this one here. This is the School of Athens. Now, the School of Athens is an amazing piece of art, perhaps one of the most important from the Renaissance period, because it really blends together a lot of those thematic approaches and techniques that the Renaissance artists focused on. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up a link and you can actually explore this piece of work on your own. 
I'm also going to put up a video which will give you a little more background about this piece of art. Um, what I will say about this is you're going to see elements of perspective, terrascuro, sfumato. You're also going to see a focus on humanist ideas as well as secular ideas. Now, when we talk about the Renaissance, I don't want you to think it just happens in Italy. And it, Renaissance themselves have happened in other places uh, in the world at different times. But the Renaissance, as it relates to Europe, it begins in Italy and it is going to spread northwards. It is going to spread all the way to Spain, all the way to England, and easterly as well. Okay, so just real quick, I just want to show you again. There will be an activity for you to explore. It's an inventions quiz. You can test your knowledge by browsing Leonardo's machinery sketches and see if you can figure out what they were concepts for what types of inventions. I'm also going to put up a link so you can explore the School of Athens. There's some real interesting things you can find out. Much of these figures in the School of Athens were from uh, Greco-Roman traditions, so it really illustrates that focus on classical traditions. Some of the figures that you'll find illustrated by Raphael in the School of Athens are philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. You can find famous figures like Alexander the Great. You can even find the artist, although it's not I don't know why they didn't actually um, put information here. If you look here at this figure that's looking back at you, Raphael actually painted himself into the art. Now, this was something that was somewhat common for artists to do. Not always would they paint themselves into the art. Usually, though, what they would do is paint the likeness of one of their patrons into the piece of art. If we think back to um, the significance of patrons, why they would pay artists to create works of art. It was so they could show their wealth and prestige. And have yourself included in the piece of art demonstrated uh, great wealth and great prestige. So I would invite you to take a look at this link, take a look at the uh, School of Athens, and just get a little more information about some of the other figures included in here. And then last, if you really want to deep dive, this is a 10 minute video where we have a look at the School of Athens and some of the different techniques and different figures. You just get more perspective about it. OK, everybody, that's it for today. I uh, hope you have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow.